The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack <clears throat> Chapter 17 Are you Catholic? Ethan asked his waitress, pointing at a cross that she was wearing around her neck. She looked as if she had been pretty once. But maybe after having children and hitting the wall, or just working here for a truck stop diner for God knows how long. She'd grown too plump for her uniform and lost the spring in her step. She still possessed the professional charisma of a seasoned waitress. Her name tag said her name was Susie. What? Oh, not really. That was my grandmother's. She was Catholic, I think. Are you? Asked Susie with a smile. No. I do like the cross, though, Ethan said, nodding his head in approval. Thanks. Can I get you anything else? She wasn't being rude, but dinner was unreasonably busy, and she had tips to chase. No, coffee is fine. I hope you don't mind me waiting here for someone, Ethan said. No, don't mind at all. Just holler if you need anything, Susie said. Then, after wiping down the table next to his booth, she disappeared behind him. Ethan had mixed feelings about religion, but he knew Americans on the right. Even those who shared European heritage were too diverse to properly form a close-knit and effective community. As long as they lacked a shared religion, traditions, or ideology in the same way the Muslims and Jews had, that was the problem with the diversity lie. America had already been diverse, even at its founding, making it more diverse did not strengthen the country. It undermined the birthright of its inhabitants. By introducing new immutable groups with their own religions, traditions, and ideologies, uncompromising groups that would not assimilate Instead, they would band together and work for common interests that were often in opposition to the Founders' ideals. They would slowly work to dismantle America and fight to remake in the image of the countries that they had come from. To make matters worse, any time the descendants of the Founding Fathers sought to band together, or demonstrate pride in their ancestors, or foster a sense of community among their extended European family. They were shamed by the media and all of the other groups that had been trained to distrust Europeans. They had never tired of raising their, the specter of Hitler. <laughs> They had never tired of raising the specter of Hitler as an example of European evil. Anyone who worried the interests of ethnic minorities entering the country by millions might not align with the culture that the majority had descended from and had been entrusted with were immediately smeared as the reincarnation of Hitler. The baby boomer generation who had been raised by television networks and rock and roll record labels also had fathers or uncles that died fighting Nazis. Invoking Hitler's name was particularly effective on boomers. But there was also a religious aspect that nobody wanted to talk about. Growing up in the 90s, Ethan had witnessed all the name-brand Christian denominations profess their undying support for Israel and love of the Jewish people whenever they had a chance to do so in public. After all, it was a great way to get good press. 
the term Judeo-Christian was thrown around endlessly as if it hadn't just been made up recently and fraudulently. And fraudulently represented as a term used by the Founding Fathers. Ethan had never thought much of it. He had been told that the Jews were basically like Christians that just didn't believe in the New Testament. Other than that, they were basically the same as Christians. At least, that's what he was told. Most Christians seem to have this same basic and fundamentally ignorant view of the Jews. It wasn't so much the result of some trick being played on Christians but it was because, unlike Jews, Christians were very open about their religion. The Bible was available in every language, whereas the original Jewish texts were still only available in Hebrew. Christians would discuss their faith with anyone that would listen. They would send missionaries all over the world to spread their message and convert people. They would jump at the opportunity to invite new friends to their church. And they were no real big secret differences between the numerous sects. It was because of this openness that Christians practiced in the public space that they naively thought that members of other religions, like Jews and Muslims, behaved in the same way when it came to transparency. In fact, many Christians believed that these other religions were probably about the same as Christianity in terms of morals, principles, but they just had different customs and different names for the same ideas. Ethan's mother had been one of those foolish Christians Ethan's mother was a baby boomer, and it was something she had said to him back in the late 90s that had come back to him recently. It was the missing puzzle piece that led him to understanding the Christian baby boomer devotion to Israel and Jews in general that ignorance alone could not explain. Ethan's mother, like many Christians in the 90s, had also believed that Jesus might be returning in the year 2000. She believed that the second coming was right around the corner. For 2000 years, Christians had been faithfully waiting for their Savior to return. And this was finally going to be it. And then, nothing happened. That's when Ethan's mother had remarked, We still have a lot of prophecy to fill, to fulfill, I guess. This perplexed Ian. When Ethan had asked what prophecy she meant, she had said, Well, the tribes must be gathered in Israel, for one. There it was. Finally, he understood why Christians would fight to the death to keep... Israel Jewish Why they had gone along with the Rothschilds plan to take Israel from the Palestinians in the first place and why Christian boomers would eternally cuck for Israel They ignored the hypocrisy of Israel as an ethno state that promoted multiculturalism multiculturalism everywhere around the world except within their walls the boomers were literally trying to fulfill a biblical prophecy. They had been convinced by others and themselves that in order for Jesus to come back, they had to support Israel. If only they knew what some Jews believed would happen when the same prophecy was fulfilled. If only they knew that they were destined to become the slaves of God's chosen people. Leveraging Christianity to produce a common bond between the ancestors of the founding fathers was crucial. 
It would help to forge the kind of bond necessary to fight the degeneracy of the culture, the erosion rights, and transformation of demo demography. The trouble was that it came with significant drawbacks. Ethan sometimes wondered if Christianity needed another reformation. The kind that Mel Gibson would get behind. A reformation that was aligned more with the interests of the Gentiles and not so closely with the Jewish view that the Jews were God's chosen people and the interests of Christians came second if they came at all. A Christianity that promoted the idea that God favored the followers of Christ and not the people who crucified him. It amused Ethan thinking about all the establishment right-wing hacks that have been complaining for the year for years why Islam really needed to be westernized when in reality it was Christianity that should be taking notes on how to preserve its values, traditions, and autonomy. Islam can't modernize. These fantasies of a westernized Islam do nothing but further highlight the Christian ignorance of other religions. The Quran came straight from Muhammad's mouth. It wasn't like the Bible which was a collection of books written by various people, some whose names we don't even know. Books have been added and removed over the years because they were written by mortal men. If the Bible had written, been written by Jesus himself, it too would be taken literally like the Quran. To alter the words of the Quran was to alter the words of God. <clears throat> No imam ever presumed to change the message that came directly from Muhammad's mouth. It was an act punishable by death, which was why the Quran had never been changed and never would. Morning, Preacher Ryan, Ethan said, to a middle-aged man wearing khakis and a shirt that seemed to clash with his expensive shoes and sunglasses. The man looked like someone who was accustomed to wearing expensive suits, but had, on this day, lost his luggage and was forced to buy what was ever, whatever was available in the airport gift shop. Don't call me that. People might recognize me, this man said nervously. Well, if you don't sit the fuck down, I can guarantee that everyone in this, rec in this restaurant is going to recognize you. Ethan's voice was ice cold. From his reaction, one might get the impression that the middle-aged man was used to giving orders, not taking them. But the way he obediently sat in front, in the booth in front of Ethan, made it just as clear that he was afraid. Jesus, take off the sunglasses, man. It's like you're trying to look like the pedo or something, Ethan said with a dis disgust in his voice. The man was aghast. He had frozen completely when Ethan had said the word pedo. Now it looked as if he might flee in terror at what Ethan might say next. You leave, you will wish you hadn't. I can promise you that. You walk out that door before I say it's okay. I swear to you that if you don't believe in hell now, you will. I will destroy your life and your legacy. As God is my witness, you will kill yourself to, ex to escape the shame. I, I would never commit the sin of the man stammered. Ethan slapped the sunglasses off the off preacher Ryan's face and they clattered to the floor. 
Ethan's eyes stared unblinking and unconcerned through the preacher's soul as he gasped and looked around to see if anyone had witnessed the altercation. Oh, you would kill yourself to escape the shame, preacher. Maybe, even after killing that pretty wife of yours. Madeline, right. Maybe, in a panic, after you realize what you've done. You would burn it all to the ground. Have you ever seen what fire does to a body? They'd need to get both of your dental records just to make sure it was you. And the photos they'd find at your office? Well, that's all the motive they'd need to try and get this case behind them as quick as possible. A murder-suicide. Isn't that what they call them? Preacher? Preacher Ryan's lips quivered as Ethan stared unblinkingly at him. Through him. Isn't it? Ethan again asked. Yes. You know, Preacher, you don't understand how lucky you are. Usually when I find out a man is fucking kids, we don't exchange so many words. You understand? I am offering you a kindness you don't deserve. That makes me your new god. And I need to know that you understand that, preacher. So I'm going to have to hear you say it. Ethan's voice was cold and smooth. Say what? Muttered Ryan. Who's your god now, preacher? Ethan asked menacingly. You are, Ryan said, pathetically. I am what? Ethan said, maintaining his intense posture and gaze. You're my god now, Ryan said, defeated. And what's your first commandment? Ethan asked, smiling. Not to touch kids. Ryan muttered quietly. That's good. Good. You want to know why? Ethan sat back in the booth and seemed to relax. I deserve this. Ryan began to cry. Stay with me, preacher. It's because your God is a vengeful God. And like hell, you deserve this. The things you've done, you probably never thought you'd get to sit down to fa face to face with God after what you've done. Yet here you are, face to face. You and I both know what you deserve, and it's not this. Ethan hissed. It took every ounce of willpower that Ethan had not to execute this subhuman piece of filth that he was blathering with in front of him. In front of him. He had to fight fire with fire, and it was hard for him to adopt some of the methods of the enemy, but the most challenging aspect of this strategy was to be in such close proximity to evil without being able to snuff it out. These in individuals that had no principles and betrayed their own people at the first opportunity, all so they can indulge in their ugly pleasures. This was the poison that needed to be purged from the system. The modern world had upset the natural order of things allowing these devils to thrive. He wanted to remove them all from the earth. But just as the enemy had learned, sometimes the people that were most adept at controlling the others were the kinds of people that were easiest to control. Ryan would help sow the seeds of revolution with a valuable demographic 
the alpha slaves who kept the deep state running. It was important, however, that Ethan remained mindful of the risks. The risks that had become a reality under the reign of the enemy. Like the risk that all of your games, your game pieces become the kind of hideous creatures this man was. A beast of exploitation. A kitty fucking reprobate who lived off the kindness and innocence of others. The risk that they would outnumber those who played the game for the right reasons. The risk that the system itself would become so saturated with parasites that if the rot and decay were removed, there would be nothing left. Ethan decided that from now on he would need to specify what he needed to gain from these monsters before using them in this way. If he became dependent on them or if their usefulness was open-ended, they would cease to be disposable and instead become vital pieces of the new system as they had in the old. He needed them to serve their purpose and then be properly disposed of before they contaminated the system. <clears throat> In the preacher's case, he would need to set milestones, objectives, and timelines. If the preacher failed to deliver, he would be removed from the game board without hesitation. More importantly, if the preacher succeeded, he must be if the preacher succeeded, he must be removed to prevent the new system from deploying dependency on such filth. Right now the objectives were pretty simple. The preacher was the head of the mega church of choice for the bureaucrats of the swamp. Ethan was initially surprised that such an institution existed, but had learned that the church had been a byproduct of the Hansen administration. Hansen was a Christian conservative with strong evangelical support. After he was elected, he brought in several of these evangelicals of to staff the various agencies. Eventually the church had become a great place to network and had grown into this sort of new age social club with charismatic preachers who were more like motivational, speecher, motivational speakers than clergy. Ryan was one of these speakers that had taken over the main stage about five years ago. He had helped the church expand massively into the surrounding areas. This was easy to do thanks to the surge in federal employees and the creation of so many new agencies. His congregation numbered in the thousands. There was a massive complex that resembled a cross from space near the shopping mall in Nicolene, Virginia. Bureaucrats gathered in such numbers that a shuttle service between all three of the six-level parking garages and the church was required to get everyone to the stadium-sized chapel. If that wasn't good enough, there were also several satellite churches throughout Maryland, Virginia, two in T D.C. also that broadcast Ryan's sermons to his flock. Ethan knew that many of these bureaucrats were decent people that either didn't know or didn't want to know that they were the evil that they were supporting. They didn't know the extent of the crimes they had helped cover up on a daily basis. Some of them undoubtedly were aware and most likely 
some of them even participated and that made them an enemy but Ethan himself had worked with some of these agencies he knew they were good people and he had to at least try to reach them End of chapter 17.